Welcome back to Melbourne Strength Cultures Podcast, number one in the hearts, number one in the charts. We're back with a very special guest, one of the one of Melbourne's finest, I would say. <laughs> yeah, Anthony Krisner, absolute goat of powerlifting over the last. When did you start lifting? Start lifting? Or start when did you start powerlifting? powerlifting? I think my first comp was 2015. Because I remember Didier was telling a story. Yeah, it's um, it's funny. When I first was getting into powerlifting, probably about then, like just kind of sussing out online, I was Googling like powerlifting Australia and you were one of the first lifters I saw. It was you and Andrew Tang. There was some like, oh, uh, yeah. there was some comp recaps. <laughs> I think it might've been a comp in New South Wales or something. Yeah. And, yeah you were squatting like probably 300 back then in sleeves. Like, Rory, that was... I never you were junior back then, yeah. Yeah, there was one comp in Sydney where I think I did... 290 something yeah and then yeah. my third comp i did like 316 like a Crazy. 21 kilo oh, so you, oh, you it was ugly though that was in canberra <laughs> yeah because you you're, you're i think that might be the one i think it was a bit over 300 though so yeah. yeah yeah it was atrocious it took me seven seconds to go from the bottom to the top <laughs> it was a grinder it was a grinder <laughs> yeah i was looking at the floor like. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna need that video we'll, we'll, yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's I, I, some, I, po- I repost every few years yeah man if a fly landed on my back i would have missed and it you was, got it up yeah, I, I was coached by old mate Rob Wilkes at the time. Yeah. And um, you see in the video, I hit the hole and I just collapse. You didn't right? get your chest up, he, mate. No, yeah, I don't think it's, that's what you just, 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 no. So you see, he just goes like this and walks away. And then he hears the crowd start losing it. And, and he back. comes back of and he's course. like, oh. He thought you were done. Yeah, everyone did, man. Like Manjot and that was spotting. Yeah. Pretty yeah. sure they were thinking like, do I take this? Like, yeah. at what point do we care? Is this guy going to die? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Manjot, that's another one. Manjot vomiting. That was oh. that were the old days of powerlifting Australia. Yeah, it was the first time I met Nathan Baxter and Manjot threw up on his shoes, <laughs> squatting. What what year was that? Did you say? Uh, which one? That when, when the the grinder or the vomit? The actually both. I think the grinder would have been twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. Because man, so we wait, were there. I, I'm pretty we, sure we came to that nationals. It was at the fitness expo. Uh, was, the was grinder wasn't at the wasn't at the expo, nationals? but no, no, it was just um. So my fourth comp was IPF Worlds. So yep. I did this one in Canberra to qualify. I think it was around May yep. to qualify for IPF Worlds as a yep. junior. Yep. Man, so I started powerlifting before you because I started with John Paul Kauke in 2014. Yeah. So People I started, don't know, but Jamie's a powerlifting OG. People yeah. don't know that. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I started lifting just before I was 21. So if I stuck with it, I could have looked like You could have looked Oh, Fuck. You don't want to look like me. You could have looked like me. <laughs> No, you could have been stronger than me. 100%. Oh, shit. How, how would your golf game be? Oh, yeah. How, oh, yeah. No. 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 One of my clients <laughs> no. plays golf now. He Somebody... got really into it and he messed his shoulder up. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. No, someone I didn't expect to play golf messaged me recently. Dan uh, Leal? Uh, nah. Someone... My client. Actually, no, he's reached out to me. After the comp, he reached out to me. Um, but no, it wasn't him. Someone completely ran and I was like, yeah, sidetrack, doesn't matter. That's crazy that you started uh, after... That's that's really cool. And then obviously, so you, you went to Worlds, 2000. Yeah, terrible idea. Which Worlds was that? What was uh, a terrible idea? Killeen, Texas, 2016. Oh, yep. Terrible idea because, man, I had done, so I'd done my first comp 2015 in England. I lived in England and I'd lived in GPPF. Came here. Lifted in what? The Great Britain Powerlifting Oh, Federation. that's so the, IPF, the IPF one. Yeah, yeah, so IPF affiliate over there back when I was an IPF boy. And then came here, competed once in Sydney, once in Canberra, went to Worlds. And as a lot of people, and you guys know, I have really bad anxiety. Now, I actually, it's funny because I was talking to Will Crows about this. I'm the complete opposite now. I don't get anxious about comps. Yep. I sleep fine. I compete really well. That's when I'm kind of the most confident, right? It's like I have re- a lot of fun with it. But back then, I was sitting there dry reaching for weeks. Every oh, really? time I thought about it, I'd be like, Ugh, Ugh, and like couldn't eat. I lost. What, what specifically? The, the being on the platform? The, yeah, just or? being on the, and the like just being scared and lifting in front of people and stuff yep. like that. Right. I was just a mess. Um, so I just was not ready for it. I had not developed as a lifter. I had no maturity as a lifter, as, as an athlete. Yeah. Um, back then athlete. <laughs> and then, uh, it's not like Rob to push people in no, hard though. Right? Right? <laughs> and then, so I went there and I lost like, I was a super heavyweight. I lost like five kilos. Yep. I wasn't eating. I went there like three or four days before, like, it's so pretty it was, rushed. It was hot as. Yeah. Big like, fly. Couldn't rehydrate. I tore my quad. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Like, so I just wasn't ready as a lifter. Like, just too much pressure too early in my career. Whereas now, it'd be chill. But as your fourth comp, someone with a lot of anxiety already. And this is something I tell my lifters. Like, don't rush it. Like, the comps are going to be there. And if, like, you know, I was already pretty strong. I would have qualified for comps in the future anyway. Yeah, in a couple of years. There was no years. need to rush. But 
when you're young, you're starting, you want to kind of get your whole career out of the way to start, right? And that's why a lot of people burn it's out. It's like though. a lot of the, a lot of the, like we talk about a lot, a lot of the young lifters come in and they're asking, oh, what are the records? I want to be in yeah. this weight class. What's strong for this age? Like yeah. Those kind of like I, get, I get, I've got it. Yeah. Sometimes I'll get a bit frustrated because I'm like, they're the ones that, yeah, they, they come in and they, within three months they're gone. I'm like, man, you, you were asking all the wrong questions. Like the right questions would be like, oh, what should my program look like? How many days a week should I train? The training intensity, all those things, consistency over time. And they're just worried about records. Powerlifting is one of the only things, and this is something I tell a lot of my lifters, it's one of the only things where people come in with the idea that from the very get-go, before they've even done it, they want to be the best. They want right? to be competitive. And they're yes. like, what are the best lifting? And you get the messages on Insta all the time. What's good for my age and weight? And you're like, well, what are you lifting? 100 kilos, that's awesome. Like you're doing well, yeah. right? Like. Um, but they look at the records and go, I need to be the best. And I always ask people, I'm like, what are you the best at in everything else in your life? And they're like, oh, you know, nothing. I'm like, are you the best at your job? Are you the best driver? Are you like, think about anything. Like, I'm not the best at anything except sleeve lifting in Australia, which is a <laughs> pretty niche market. But like, you're fucking good at but it. Do you know what I mean though? Like, yeah, and, yeah. and it's a it's a weird, weird thing people get when they start the sport and they're like, well, I want to lift with the best or I want to be the best. And then it kills motivation when they realize pretty quickly it's tough. that there's a lot of work there. And, you know, everyone has different points where they're going to slow down. So in my first year, I lifted for less than a year. I deadlifted 300 in comp, right, in uh, on a, on a Elico bar. I squatted 265, 270 and benched 170, yep. something like that. I was 122 kilos. Didn't know anything about it. I think I was doing Shigo five day on the <laughs> app back in the day, right, on the Android app. Um but then that was super quick. But then the journey from like squatting, and then I squatted 316 not long after. The journey from like 316 to 335 as a tested lifter took years. Yeah. Right. But some people have find that point where they slow down at 160, 200, 220. Um, but then, yeah, there's people that come in with the idea that they want to be the best from the very get go. That's usually when they quit, mm. right? When they hit a little bit of a speed bump. I was just having this conversation with a lifter the other night. And they were talking, you know, they'd slowed down a lot in their progress and they've been lifting for a long time and it's to be expected. Um, and I was like, you know, people don't forget. So I I got stuck at a, I got a 212 bench and I cut to 120s and I got stuck at 195, 196 for ages. Like I remember this. I remember this. Yeah my, yeah, yeah. my squat went back up. My deadlift, I was PBing. My bench just wouldn't budge. It just had, it had nothing else in it. Yeah. Then I switched to untested like a few years ago, uh, two and a half, three years, 2020, I think. And, um, my bench skyrocketed. Well, it's flying now. Well, it, it's gone up heaps, but it still took me since February last year to put five kilos on my bench. Wow. In untested. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's 240 is a big bench. That's five kilos in a year and a half. Yeah. It's, and that's a hard four, five kilos. I've hit rep PBs the whole time, done a lot of work. I've benched three days, two days, four days. We've tried everything. Yeah. And sometimes progress is just slow to come. Uh, and, okay. and that's the thing that a lot of people probably wouldn't see like... <clears throat> Someone might be benching 120 and upset that they've only put on five kilos on their bench in a year, but someone at your level, that's just something you have to accept sometimes. And yeah. for that, that's just that's just part of it. Like if at you, every if, level, if at every level, if they were just to give up because they thought five kilos in a year wasn't good, they're never going to allow themselves to see that progress. Or the same thing, if you had to just stopped benching and just throwing the towel in, well, that, that'd be it. There'd be no more progress. Yeah, 100%. Made, right? Like I have no. Like, I'm a good bencher at 125. I'm never going to be a great, like, bencher on the world. Like, you know, these guys are doing, what, oh, yeah. 300 plus yeah. now. There's a few of them doing 300 plus at 125. It's, it's cooked. Like, mm. but I think at, you know, I want to, I'll be doing, I'm 29, 30 next year. I'll be, I'll be competing for a fair while, you know, unless I have any career ending injuries, which I hope I don't. Um, but I don't think I'll ever bench over, you know, 250, 260 max. Like, and it's, I'm okay with that. Like, um, doesn't mean I'm going to, I don't, I'm not lazy yeah. with my bench. I love yeah. bench work. You know what I mean? It's not that I don't train it hard. It's just, it's like, we all have different limits. I've, uh, I've been, the, I was the same too. My bench flew. Like I, I remember when we started training, I was benching like, it was always ahead. It was always the big one. And I, like, I took my bench from 120 to like 160, like that real quick. And then I hit 172 three years ago and it took me over two years to hit a two and a half, a three kilo PR to get to 175 kg. Um, but in that process, squat and dead have they're flown up and it's just like the, it happens, but yeah, no, 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 people don't really talk about it. Do they? They just, no, people will talk about progress being slow in that, but yeah, yeah. they won't give good examples. Right? Yeah, no, that's I'd, a great example there for you. Yeah, you got, yeah, you got sure. two, two had, examples there. I had one lifter that didn't PB his deadlift for like two years and then bang, 15 kilos, yeah. Yeah. you know, out of nowhere. Like it just, it's not, and this, you hear it all the time, but it's not linear. I think JP Kauke, 
said it really well. I said goat. the name right, right? Yeah, the goat. Um, <laughs> JP made a post. Hey, this is years ago, but he he was like, if I never PB, if you knew you would never PB again, would you still lift and would you still train as hard? I remember this post. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it stuck with me. And I was like, yeah, I would. Like, I, I just love lifting. I love the people I lift with. I love training hard. I love lifting heavy. Like, uh, you know, I'm never going to stop lifting even when I retire from competing. Um, but I think a lot of people wouldn't, right? Or they'd change yeah. their training uh, up. They. Um, well, I remember when he made that post, we had a conversation. And at that time, <clears throat> I was like, nah, fuck that. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what, but... <laughs> this is what four years later now and I've completely done a 180 on it Compl- like I'm enjoying training more than I ever have before and I'm not worried about making PRs and stuff like the PRs they, st- they still come naturally you train up you rock up do the work they're going to come but I'm enjoying just the process of training so more many people so, don't realise that yeah. hey though like if you enjoy your training you put in the work you train hard you enjoy what you're doing that's that's how you get the results yeah. right if you stress so much about things, or, you know how many people do you know that like don't have a good bench so they're just cruise through their bench training don't yeah or they, they they tell themselves i'm yeah i'm never going to be good or like I, I, i've got long arms I, i'll yeah. never i'll never get it and then they just put in 50 percent effort and then they get 50 percent outcomes they don't they actually will never have an opportunity to pr- progress we interrupt this program for a word from our sponsors which is get going get going is a national health and fitness company they link personal trainers up with a whole battery of clients around the nation and they are looking for more pts the beautiful thing about working with get going is they have an entire sales and marketing team behind them that will guarantee you leads at your door so if you're a young personal trainer looking to get into the business quite often with trying to get started in these commercial gyms. I know a lot of us here had op- opportunities at commercial gyms. It just never really worked out for us. Uh, quite often you get forgotten about there and you're sort of on your own to, to find leads and, and, and to, to challenge the marketing and sales by yourself. That's the, the best thing that Get Going has for you. You don't have to worry about any of the business side of things. You can just work and, and work on your craft and, and get clients the results that they're after. So... If you're interested and you are a young PT looking to get started in the field, you can go through www.getgoingpt.com.au forward slash careers, or you can go through the link in the description box on YouTube or the bio of the podcast link here. Tell them we sent you and change some lives for the better in the industry. Thank you. What a, what a lot of people probably don't see, like Charlie sometimes jokes about it, like, oh, he doesn't care about hitting PBs, but it's, on, it's, it's honestly the truth. Like I've seen it for years, like, like if, if Charlie does a comp and he doesn't necessarily do what he like thinks he could have done or maybe what other people thought he could have done, it doesn't get to him, but he just keeps turning up, keeps putting in the work. And lo and behold, over the years, you've gotten a lot stronger, but you're not fixated on certain mm-hmm. numbers. You're not like, if yeah, you want to get stronger, but you're not like, I need to hit this number or else. Like you just keep putting in the work and over time, the results come. And, and the, the key thing is like with anyone, you've put consistent effort over time, day in, day out for years and you get stronger. The- Stressing about those numbers doesn't necessarily is it it going to get you where you want to be. It's not helpful. And the big yeah. thing that changed for me early on, I realized this pretty quickly, and I, I did a lot of <clears throat> mentoring with JP. He helped me a lot. Early days, trained at the Fortress heaps and used to bombard him with questions, um, was not putting my value, my self-worth in my numbers. Because as you said, a lot of people come into powerlifting, they think I've got to be doing this, I've got to be hitting records, I've got to be doing that, I've got to be you know, getting to worlds or competing international internationally. And they put their value in it. And so if they don't do it, they feel shit about themselves. And I found I was doing that. So I've got to deadlift 300. And if I don't deadlift 300, if I don't squat 220 or whatever it was at the time, I'm just, I'm shit. I'm not, I'm not good. I'm not a like, and then when I dropped the, and realized that actually no one really cares about the numbers I'm hitting. It's all the pressure I'm putting on myself. I started to enjoy training so much, so much more. I had this realization and someone was telling me that they were really good at a sport. I'm not going to say sport because <laughs> they'll know who it is, but like, <laughs> like I'm one of the best in the world. And I was just like, I actually just don't, don't care. care. <laughs> like, hey, that's cool. Like, I'm happy for you, but I literally, that elicits no feelings in me. And then I realized, oh. It's the same. This is how everyone it's else a, feels outside of lifting about my lift. And yeah. there's the mirror. Yeah, right? Yeah. It was like, it was just like, it was like, oh, that's like, all right. Like, now I get it. Like, you know. When I'm like, hey, mum, I squatted 400. She's like, oh, nice. I'm proud of you. She's like, dude, the <laughs> yeah, 100, funny. 200, 300. But wash your sheets, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah just clean up after yourself. But no, 100%, man. Like, that's why, you know, 
like I'm, I've been working my grip really hard and you know I had no doubt I was going to hold on to 380 this comp that was that I had to pull out from it's going for a really big total but like some, someone and multiple we mentioned after pro where I dropped my deadlift and you see this like slight second of like frustration and then I was like ah oh, I laughed it right. off and be, like you know that that would get to a lot of people but what am I going to man I'll have I'll either I either have it or I don't I'm going to get it next time or I'm not there's always a next time though and to bring and this is what a lot of people don't realize as well you can progress, but we're trying to bring it all together on one day. And there's a lot of variables. There's a lot that can go wrong. People are cutting weight. The flights can be short, whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? Like you could look at the best lifters in the world. They all rely on having the best comp. That Super they have mate. To, yeah. You know, they go nine for nine and they hit these stupid totals. I mean, look at Dan Bell, right? Hits these stupid totals, but he hasn't PB'd his squat. He made a post about it in over a year, but it doesn't bother him. His total's progressing. But yeah, mm. like when you're trying to bring it all together for one big day, like and one or two little things go wrong, it, it, might, your, it might not reflect in your performance on the day, but you've progressed as well. And I think a lot of people, yeah, they they put a lot of weight on that. They let it get them down. But in my head, I'm just like, oh, I'll just try again next time. And one yeah. day I'm going to have that meet. I'm going to go nine for nine. I'm going to do something <laughs> stupid and I'll probably never do it again. Yeah, <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? hundred percent. But I definitely take the more stoic approach with lifting. It's like control what you can control and the things you can't control, like don't worry, worry about it. But like with, um, I always look at it with, with miss lifts. It's like you, there was two things that went wrong. You either technically stuffed it up or you just weren't strong enough. So if you weren't strong enough, you can't really control that on the day. Yeah. What you can control is go back to training, put in a few good cycles of hard training, whatever it may be, get on top of your nutrition. And that's going to help you get stronger and then get it next time. If it was a technical thing, obviously then we use variations and stuff to help work on that 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 technical mishap that happened on the day. But like trying to just f fixate, yeah, fixate on the things you can control and, and move away from those things that you can't and, control. And, and then it sometimes leads to like trying to find, and this isn't necessarily a competition, even in the gym, like a, a lifter will, a lift will be harder than they wanted or something will break down technically. And they're just trying to find what that reason was. And sometimes the, the sad answer is you just weren't strong enough or you just didn't execute. And not everyone wants that because they want a very clear answer. If I do this variation, if I yeah. have this cue, it's going to fix it. But sometimes you need to accept it just, it just wasn't there that yeah, day. And we need to come back and, and try just, again. Like, like I've got pretty bad ADHD, but it's only like with lifting. You know, I mean, I've stuck with it for a long time. I, like I'll never stop, but like I just move on from things. So like, what can I do better? What can we do to fix this? So I dropped that deadlift at Pro Raw. I was like, well, I've been pretty slack on my grip training. Like, am I going to be upset? I'm just going to go train my grip now. I'm an idiot, you know? Or, and that's the other, you get a lot of people, they'll, they'll get really frustrated missing a lift. And I'm like, well, the other question is, are you doing what you can be doing right? Or are you slacking on your accessories? You know, are you slacking on your nutrition, your sleep, things like that? Like, not not questions a lot of people want to get asked though. Because yeah. it's, it can yeah, be the confronting. tough ones, yeah. 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 Actually, I've got a, a question about grip training. Yeah, I, I was I, ask this that. has been a theory in my head that, does grip training actually, for somebody of your size and strength and at your level, does grip training actually do anything? Um, I've noticed, so I, I do hook grip now on dead and it's this left hand, like as I lock it out, it pushes it out because I've got really big quads, it pushes it out a little bit and changes the angle. And then these fingers oh, so start your hand up. like moves, this, it rubbing go, on your quad. The angle changes yep. like that and then it starts to open it up. Now I can deadlift heavier, much heavier now um, than I could a few years ago, like I used to be dropping 340. Yep. Right. And then I dropped 350 then 360. I didn't do a lot of grip training at that time though. I just got stronger, but I've noticed there's been a massive difference in like, I can row the 70 kilo dumbbells now without straps. Whereas I couldn't do oh, the fifties yeah. before I started grip training. Yeah. Right. So I have noticed progression in my grip yep. strength massively, whether but, that correlates yeah. directly to my deadlift. No. Cause I think a lot of it is, you know, I've, I've gotten more, I don't want to, because grip training, you know, if you have grip issues, try to fix it. Well, yeah, it. you got to do something. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? Just, yeah. Like, not try, but like, yeah, I've noticed my deadlift. I started holding onto my deadlift a lot more this prep when I changed my lockout, right? So instead of leaning back a little bit at the top, I'm staying a bit more over the bar, keeping weight directly under me and I could hold onto the weight. Yeah. So I don't think I could have done that years ago though. Yeah. So like, I see what you mean. Yeah. And for me, it comes, I think it's a lot more technical than just grip strength. Because this is the thing, I've got weak grip but the grip, my script's are way stronger than most people's. Yeah, fucking right. Enough. Like, um, you got some people like Dylan Hellriegel who are just never going to have a grip issue in their life. They're freaks. And I met him on the weekend. Or oh, how big is he? <laughs> no, like it doesn't do it justice. No, no, it does not. Like I've obviously been around. Like when you're in powerlifting scenes, like that, you, you come across some just big, fucking dudes. large people. Like really, six foot seven. 
but then seventy something kilos. But even just on the platform, mm. like especially, I saw it when it when we were squat, it, they were squatting in the mono, and it, you had like um, Joe Whitaker walk out, and like he's a fucking mountain of a human. But then Dylan would walk out, and he just consumes the whole like yeah. it, like it's just not. Nothing does it justice how big that guy is. And funny story, everyone knows those little like folding black chairs that everyone has at events. <laughs> we were just sitting in the back of the... I went up and shook his hand and I couldn't even get my hand to clasp the underside of his palm. Like my hand was like flat in his palm. It was like a bare hand. And I, 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 I turned around, I walked away, I was like, whoa. Like I've never shook someone's hand like that before. And then I turned back around and he was on the ground and he just flattened one of those chairs. Like completely just like the thing... Busted, and he was sitting on the ground. And then Thomas Vale actually went and helped him up. And I'm like, I'm like, how are you going to pick him up? It's like 180 kilos. Like, yeah. So Dylan tried to give me grip advice, and I was like, bro, I'm not. Like his grip advice, like, have you just actually tried? And he's being, he's like, have you tried just holding it? And I, he's like, but I mean, like, have you tried, like, you know, are you actually squeezing the bar? And I'm like, yes, Dylan, I'm squeezing the bar. And I was like, and I'm looking, at him like, you have no right to give me grip advice when you just probably double overhand 300 kilos. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he he's just huge, massive. What are some of the things that you've been doing to train your grip to bring um, it up? So I tried like for a long time double overhand like holds and that I just couldn't hold them heavy enough to get any you know what i mean i always got stuck up so just double overhand not hook no 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 like so yeah so just he, like overhand. static holds and people always preach that so for me i actually one direct forearm work too i got this grip trainer made someone uh, online made it for us at apex they made themselves one too where you just go on you load it up with plates and you literally just open and close it right and you can do static holds with that um and then i do this thing where I hold dumbbells and then I, I roll them down as far as I can in my fingers and then pick and them then back pick up and back squeeze up. them hard. So direct forearm work has helped. Not sitting there doing forearm curls, but things like that have helped heaps. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I wasn't even doing static holds. And I went from being able to double overhand 170 to 220, yeah. right, in like probably eight weeks. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so like very, very... Uh, steep progression I went from being able to row barely row the 50s to the 70s without straps so yeah. honestly just like yeah doing work like letting the dumbbells roll all the way down bringing them back up and squeezing them hard right out in front of me like this and um, using that grip trainer and then some direct form with like grip rollers and stuff yeah um, so it's, it's definitely there's some objective progress it's just whether or not it's translated yeah, yeah. and it's like anything right yeah, like, yeah 100% yeah. You squat, like, welcome to life you can <laughs> Like yeah. leg extension, the stack and work up to that, but is it going to add yeah. kilos to your squat? Well, your quads are stronger. Absolutely. But. Yeah. Um, I want to just, before we, because I do want to talk about the weekend and obviously like you, you heard, actually let's just go there now. So you were meant to compete at, at Breakthrough yeah. um, and I was excited to see you up there and I messaged you about the potty and I was like, oh, I'll see you in the weekend. But then uh, you were like, no, nah, I'm not going up. You hurt your knee, your meniscus. Yeah, yeah. So they th were still waiting for the MRI. It's ridiculous. Oh, but really? I think it's my meniscus. I've torn my medial meniscus. Um so I was having pain in it for ages, but you just kind of ignore it for a, for a long time. Like I was sitting there with Will when I was up in Queensland, Will Crozier, and I was sitting there and I had to keep getting out the car to straighten my leg because it was so painful. Yeah. And then I was doing one of my last heavy, or my last heavy squat, I was going 410, 390 moved really easy. 410 was going to be conservative. Um, that was going to be my second. And then I got halfway down and my left adductor lit up. So I tried, I stood back up with it, but to compensate, everything shifted to one side my right knee caved in yeah and it was just that was it cactus after that um so really painful i couldn't walk properly for days and it still hurts a lot now uh, any kind of load through flexion and anything hurts a lot yeah um so you know a bit shattered but honestly as far as injuries go this is the other thing right like a lot of people are a bit more devastated than me like sucks i miss breakthrough i am shattered you know i also a, know it was a cool event yeah you know, i know what numbers i i I wanted to hit. I know where I would have placed if I had to hit those. Doing it on the day is a different thing. Like talking about it. Doing but you it were there. Things. You were I in was the there. Mix, yeah. yeah, you know, I was I was one of the favourites for it. Mm. And um, but you know, it, as far as injuries go, a meniscus tear, powerlifting, not really a huge deal. It just takes time. Yeah, just like right, it like sucks, but it's not like I'm going to be complaining about it in a year. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a, it was a really cool event. I th I'm actually really excited, and I'd love to get your take on this because I know, obviously, just talking in this conversation, gone through. I didn't even know you competed overseas, but um, not worlds in Great Britain uh, yeah. originally. But like the feds and all of that sort of stuff. I think coming out of lockdowns, uh, that and obviously like the PA thing, and then 
now USAPL coming across, APL doing really well. Um, and then seeing this event on the weekend, like powerlifting's in a really fucking exciting spot. Like it really is. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for these sort of events, uh, especially here in Australia, which is, is really cool. And Breakthrough put on a, a, you, a great event. I was going to ask, do you want to give to people listening, like, because the weekend was, it was untested, there was tested. Do you want to give them a breakdown of how it ran, what federations it were? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, breakthrough. So, we're up in Sydney, and Anthony was meant to compete on the Sunday, which was a WRPF event um, uh, through, yeah, break, breakthrough, which was the gym, and breakthrough put this thing on. Yeah. Um, and then on the Saturday was a USAPL competition. And the great thing with USAPL um, is that it's an open fed. Like, you can... Your, you can coach uh, a cross-fed, you can compete a cross-fed and all of that, which allows these weekends and even the place can run the two feds at the same time. So on the Saturday, you can have a fully tested USAPL comp and run it really well, big prize money and all of this sort of stuff. And then on the Sunday, you can do the same thing, but with an untested fed and let let everybody like go and just like see what powerlifting I, th- I think it is the biggest spectacle of powerlifting is you just, you just see these huge lifts. Like Keita, Keita was there who's, um, I think <laughs> so she's strong, I think she's top three all time yeah. or something. Yeah, 600 and something dots. Yeah, like. Um, just insane. And then we had dinner with her after and, and she was like, she's like, yeah, in the, in the last few years she had Wildcats previously where she'd won some money. And then I think she took home just over $7,000 on, on Sunday. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can actually like win money at the, like powerlifting is becoming an actual like sport. And obviously it's very upsetting that you couldn't get there and you would have had a good chance to, but Joe Whitaker took home 15 grand on mm. the Sunday for the biggest total and, and best overall on dots. Yeah, like, I think Deuce was crunching the numbers and she's like, I would have won, if she went up there and hit her total, she she could have won like 1,500 or 1,700 bucks. Yeah, like it's- She's like, I'm going to go next year. And I was like, yeah, fuck Like it's cool. Powerlifting's in a- Great spot. What are you, what are your thoughts on all these different like obviously coming out of lockdowns and then the big thing is what is happening with the IPF and the and at the moment and the bench press rule and all that sort of right stuff, which we can get into as well. But like what what are you, what's your because a lot of people have different takes on different feds diluting and all this sort of shit. But what's your view on it all? I think it sucks that it it, it has been so fragmented in Oz at least. Um, but I think people are voting with their wallets, right and. And that's what really matters. So, you know, it sucks when the talent pool is spread out a lot, but there's not many feds left that do the you can only compete here kind of thing. So yep. that that fixes that issue. Um, like, yeah, it sucked for, like, my lifters, right? They're going to nationals and they're getting easy wins when they know what level they're lifting at. But it, it is getting better, right? So... Easy wins with which fed? Um, so, like, you know, yeah, they... Well, all of them. AP, yeah, all of them. But they go to APU, it's say, it's APU out. Nationals, right? And they know where they're going to place just because there's no one else. There's like one or two people competing. Yeah. yeah. Right? So for me, as a competitor, that would suck. Yeah. It didn't really impact me being an untested lifter. Yeah. It impacted a lot of my lifters. Um, but again, a lot of that now, the people that want to stay RPF, you know, because they're looking to go overseas and that is, I think it's the main draw to compete in the RPF. They've got their goals set on Worlds and Commonwealths and stuff. But I think, yeah, like... You know, we've noticed, uh, I noticed a huge uptake in USAPL. You guys probably know the numbers. And APL as well. We sold out this comp so quick for APL, the one coming up next week at, at Apex. So I think awesome. people, what I've noticed for my lifters, they're over, the, they're over any kind of drama. Like a lot of them just want to be coached by me now on the day, which they always did. But the draw of IPF and that was always there. Was now they're like, I just want to lift with my friends and have you to coach me and have fun. So I noticed like the last six, eight months, a lot of people are switching feds just to make it easier. And they're like, well... Now I can compete. Now I can try a deadlift bar if I want, if I ever want to. You know, one of them wants to try wraps, so he go yeah. APL tested. Um, so it's getting a lot better. Like I think it, it sucked temporarily, but um, yeah, people are making decisions, and it's reflecting now in, in at least the amount of comps that are being ran and yeah. the ships. I mean, you can see which the dominant feds are in Vic already. USAPL is probably the biggest now in Vic, right? I'd, I'd say so. I'd say so. I think. Yeah. I think. I think. Without a doubt, it will be next year. Like, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, I think right? it already is. We've got two in gyms Vic, that run Victoria. APL comps. There's a third coming on next year, and you've got two gyms that run APU comps. Oh, so then and then how many definitely. gyms running USAPL? I think we're That's already. Yeah, I think it's or, it's yeah. already yeah. bigger this year in its first year. And you um, go state to state, and you get different <coughs> answers though. Like absolutely, in, in Queensland, APL is huge. Mm. Yeah, it's huge. Um, Bloody Thomas Lily. APU is massive in New South Wales still. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's like Capo's still got Capo in South a, Australia is massive, and and um, WRPF in Tassie, well, like yeah, it's, it's all these random and WA, right? I think it's still got a lot of Capo comps. Yeah, well, the, I think it's just whatever Ruchi's run is big yeah. over there. Well, yeah. that's the thing in other states as well, you, like Sydney, Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland have a lot of powerlifting gyms. The other states have a lot less. Yeah. So when the dominant gyms run. That's what you're going to do. That's, yeah. yeah, it's where you're yeah, going to compete. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I actually like where the trend's going, you know, breakdown barriers. I've always very strongly and very vocally been against um, restricting where people, one, can compete and where people can coach. It's ridiculous to me. Like, oh, absolutely. Like, you know, coaching I'll, one I'll, never made sense. I'll follow the rules because I'm not here to cause drama, but it doesn't mean I support them. We also didn't really have a choice, though. That's Because the thing, there was right? no other option for us, especially, like, competing naturally and you want to compete. The biggest natural federations were bound by those rules. So yeah. then we were trapped in no, that 100%, federation. No, 100%. just didn't have a choice. Yeah, so it was... Um, and, you know, I just think people are like, hey, why do we put up with this for so long? That's the big thing. Like, why do we... You know, there's this... We did it because it was the way it was done for so long... And people didn't like it, but no one really pushed for a question. You also, there was a long time, it was a very big stronghold on powerlifting in Australia, like with PA, like at the time, you, no other Fed could really compete. Um, whereas now that that broke away, I think, yeah, a lot and, of and, fresh stuff's coming out of the woodwork. And that's the thing, even though, <clears throat> even though it does suck that there's been a dilution, the alternative was a f- one tested Fed basically running the show, doing a lot of stuff that people didn't like, but we didn't have any choice. So as much as, yeah, the dilution doesn't, isn't great, yeah. and there's, there's some issues with it. At least now, there's options and to fix a lot of the problems that were existing in the past yeah. for years and years. And I think it's like I said, it's becoming less diluted. Just seen that way last year, yeah, started yeah. this year, and then people kind of just like, well, all my friends are going there. That's it. Yeah, so that's you, know, you kind of, I think a lot of people, I want to say elitist because I don't think it's elitist, right? But people get tied into this idea of, say, with the IPF and that, and a lot of people are just. Like, they realize that maybe they lost sight of why they started competing. They were competing with their friends, having fun with their club. And going back to that, it's really fun. The other thing is, like you said, all the big money meets in Australia have always been untested. Tested lifters always missed out on it. And but that's changing. I think that, exactly. that is definitely changing. Exactly. Breakthrough yeah. on the weekend. Breakthrough was money meets like, tested. Like even, even, at, pro sleeves. even at Strength Fortress, like one of our lifters, one best lightweight and best uh, best uh, rookie lifter, and he won 300 bucks. Like, yeah, it's not much, but that's that's great. Like, that's, we weren't seeing yeah, that happening money, at local meets. It's in a sport you, know. you lose money on, right? So yeah, walking exactly. away, just a win. Com- yeah. you're, your year, your year's paid that's for. Exactly your comp's it. paid for. That's it. That's Do you know it. what I mean? That's yeah. a win. Like buy a belt, like or whatever. Like yeah, it, yeah like there's. But there's it's also now the, the the clubs, and I know with our comp, we could actually give money away because we made money. Yeah, it wasn't. Whereas before, there was obviously it was you were only limited to how much you got. But it, and it makes there's more of an incentive now. Like I've already noticed with those local meets, there's more of an like people want to win and they want to do better and stuff. And then and people the are watching the scoreboard because it's like 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 our, our lifter Ash, he was winning the the lightweight, and we're really paying attention to the guy that was pulling after him because like this is this, there's something the, in it now. Like yeah. we want to see if he gets it or not because it it's going to determine something. Versus oh you got you got a medal. Like no, nah, there's there's something in this now. Yeah. And yeah, I've I've noticed it with myself too this year, even just my lifting. Like I did pro raw at the start of the year, pro raw sleeves do. USAPL nationals, but even like already the breakthrough looks mad. So well, maybe next year I'll put my eyes on that or something. But it, it, it makes it so much more exciting as a lifter and also with with athletes too. And I, know, I definitely noticed last year though when it went, when everything went to shit, there was a few people that went very like dark, like powerlifting's done. It's and I, I knew I don't know I was I, maybe I was being optimistic, but I knew because obviously Jamie was deeply involved with USAPL mm. where it was going, the direction. So maybe we were getting a bit more insight into what was happening. But I was confident. I'm like this is going to yeah. bounce back. And I it's just gonna bounce think back like better. yeah, I think some people got dark. I just thought you know, uh, and what happened right? I was like it's going to suck for a while and then it'll level out. Like yeah. it always does. Like, yeah, the pendulum always comes back to correct itself. 100%. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was just a waiting game. I said that to my lifters. I was like, it's just a waiting game. So compete where you want to compete now, and then you you'll find a fed. You don't. You could compete somewhere this year. You don't need to compete there next year. Yeah. That's the thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you can pull out. Like, you can change your mind. This is the great thing, right? Like, so compete wherever you want. Have fun. <laughs> so I've had a lot of lifters switch to APL too because they just like, oh well, the comps are apex. They want to compete with all their friends, <laughs> and it's fun. You know what I mean? Like, and then. They had nationals. They got tested worlds and that. Like, it was just an easy route for them to have fun with their friends and enjoy the train, try something new with a deadlift bar and stuff. Yeah. Um, 
And then next year, I know of several of them that are switching to USAPL. Yep. Right? You know, because they've paid their yearly membership, they'll run that out and then they'll go to another Absolutely. Fed. Like, and then yeah. I was just going to say, you were saying like, we'll just write it out, and we'll, but where do we go? We go back to the start of the conversation where it's just, just enjoy training. Yeah. Keep rocking up. <laughs> have fun. Yeah. And the comps will come. And, and hope your like, deadlift holds. That's, <laughs> you know, but it, it comes back to just enjoy training in the process. Like, don't get caught in the wishy-washy of the federations. Yeah. It's and not, what's, uh, that's, you know, for me, that was the biggest thing taking when I switched to untested, taking a step back from PA at the time was just, I was like, I'm just a lifter and a coach. I'm not getting yeah. involved in any drama, any politics, and I've stayed out of politics since. Yeah. And I, it's been so good. Do you know what I mean? Just being a lifter and a coach and just running events and like, you know, um, not being involved. In the political, yeah, I, I know, other, you know, I, I know I mean? exactly like, what you mean. Yeah, It's refreshing and almost uh, reignited a fire in me for running it's meets actually, and stuff. And again, John Paul Kiaki, but a conversation I had with him, he was like, I don't want to be involved. He's like, all I, he was exactly that. He's like, all I want to do is run my gym, be a coach, be a lifter. Because everyone was sort of expecting that he was going to put his hand up to be yeah. like, to like lead the people sort of thing. And he was like, I don't want to do it. It's not something I want to do. I think that, yeah. that's pretty unfair because a lot of people are like, what's JP going to say? Yeah, exactly. Like, he doesn't need to say anything. And he man. didn't want to, he just didn't <laughs> want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is completely sure. fair. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm going to shift gears here from the from the feds and all that sort of stuff. I've just got a few uh, stories that I'd like you to uh, unpack a little bit. Number one is I remember in the middle of lockdowns and you said that you switched to untested about 2020. So the start of yeah. lockdowns? Yes. Uh, yeah, just before. And I remember everyone was training in the at home in the garage and we've talked about this a few times like we just called it like the de oh. depression stations like they were just like they were just in the garage by yourself but i remember one video where you i think you scored a 400 for the first yeah. time by yourself no so i oh man it was such a funny thing right <laughs> i thought you could have people out over outdoors at that point yeah. so i had two people come over to spot me and then JP messaged me and he's like, Hey man, I don't think it's cool that you're flouting social media. I was like, Oh dude, I just didn't know the rules. I went, I won't do it. And I didn't do it again. I was Did like, anyone I know the rules? Yeah. I was like, I didn't know. And he's like, Oh, all right, that's fair. It's pretty confusing. Right. But yeah. um, no, so I did a lot of, a lot of stupid lists at home <laughs> in my own garage. Um, but the 400 kilos. All right. So I just, I hadn't been in wraps for a long time and I had those, oh, this is a cook story, right? So this nail on my finger doesn't grow. Now, so it doesn't grow. No, oh. so that, that that day I un, I had the mono attachments that swing out the little the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're terrible, but I also I think they're only rate loaded to like two hundred kilos. Oh so. man, like I think my my I have this crappy little um your cage, squat cage your cage is it, like it's bent now. It's like it's like one yeah it would it's be aluminium. It's one, you know that orange fucking place up the road that world fitness or yeah, whatever they yeah. and they just sell like there's brands that stand out as like they're really good high quality yeah, commercial nah, I've got level a no name yeah you, and then there's like this chinese level shit <laughs> that places sell and it just like things bend nothing yeah. it's, it's warped my missus still squats on it <laughs> yeah um so and you're squatting 400 kilos yeah out. <laughs> shouldn't have because there's no <laughs> so anyway i unrack it but my hands are right where the mono attachments are so I unrack 75 kilos, first warm up, go down, come up, my finger goes straight into the mono attachment and I was squatting hard, um, like on the way up. So I, I'm like, fuck, I wrap it, I rack it and my fingers just exploded as mincemeat. Like it's, <laughs> it's like legitimately, you can see completely inside. And I was like, oh, I'm just, there's blood everywhere, just pissing out blood. So this is your warm up set? This is my first warm up set. <laughs> oh my God. And I was like, shaking and shit. I was like, oh, what do I do? And Ben was like, Ben Mack was like, do you want- Another the, king. Do you, absolute legend. He was like, do you want the meathead answer or the coach answer? <laughs> I was like, what's the coach answer? Like, dude, that looks really bad. You should go to the hospital. I was like, what's the meathead answer? He's like- Wrap it up. He's like, we're already here, man. Let's do 400. <laughs> and I was like, all right, fuck it. So I walk inside. My missus is like, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, like she looks at my finger. She's like, I can't. She walks away. So we just get some alcohol swabs, alcohol like, wipes yeah. put them around it that and then tape it up so with the much. chucks yeah it hurt a lot but then we taped Fine. up with the chucks so if you look at the video and then i warmed up man and the the issue is i had a, a massive adrenaline dump after this yeah. so like no I was, doubt yeah and so probably I was like blood feeling pressure drop as right <laughs> pain but i did a 380 double which was a huge pb and then went up and did a 400 single and um but you see in the video i'm holding the bar like this because his fingers all taped up and there's this big blue chucks anyway we do the squat they go home and I'm like, you know, I don't think it's that bad. It's like, I don't think it's that bad. So I look at it, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, it looks pretty bad. But <laughs> but like, it's just like slamming in the car door, right? So my, I was just going to go to bed. 
yeah. I felt terrible. My missus was like, go to the chemist, because she knows I wasn't going to go to hospital. She's like, go to the chemist and get a proper bandage. So I go to the chemist, show the chemist, and I go to this chemist all the time now for all my like, ADHD meds and asthma meds, and they love me there, and they're the best people, but they just remember this one day, I walk in with this exploded finger, the bone exposed. Yeah. I'm like, can I get a bandage for this? <laughs> and she was like, you need to go to the hospital. <laughs> I was like, I can't really be bothered. <laughs> She's like, go to the doctor across the road. I go in. This doctor is like a doctor I see now. He loves me too. Because <laughs> I go in there and I'm like, can you stitch it up? And he's like, he just laughed at me. He's like, stitch up what? <laughs> he's like, it's, it's like exploded, it's, man. It's like the, this mate. is the bone. And then he's like, you see this? And he's poking it. He's like, do you feel that? I was like, no. He's like, yeah, go to the hospital. <laughs> so anyway, I got um, plastic surgery like 12 hours later. So they reconstructed that dude did an awesome job. I can't even tell. Yeah, you can't tell. I just can't feel anything in, in the finger at the top. Yeah, you And like, really, the nail doesn't grow. You really crack. Yeah, fuck Yeah, no. so that's my first 400 squat. That was your first 400 squat. Was first, I was sitting, oh, it was so, because um, I've got a really high pain tolerance. Yeah. So I was sitting there and I go and it's all bandaged up. The doctor bandaged it up for me and I go to the emergency room and they're like, what's happened? I was like, oh, I hurt my finger squatting, you know, got it caught. And they're like, oh, okay, you in pain? I was like, oh, not really. So I sat in the waiting room for seven hours. You've got like, to say oh. you're in pain. Otherwise, well, they're, they're going to put right? you at the bottom but of the I, list. I, I was just, I was, I was sitting there playing my <laughs> Nintendo Switch. In the waiting room, and I'm like, this is ridiculous, waiting so long, I should just go home. And then they get me in, the doctor does an x-ray, he comes out, he's like, dude, he's this like, we fine. messed up. He's like, you need IV antibiotics. Oh, he's wow. He's like, the bone's exposed and broken. He's like, you know, you get an infection, you probably lose your finger. And then they schedule me in for surgery, like, 10 hours later, oh, 12 wow. hours later. Jeez. So you got, <laughs> you had to say it hurt. You needed to you say, need it, to say it, hurt. it hurts yeah. a lot. But at the, same, just both say it hurt. the same thing though, there was a chick that came in when I was there screaming in agony and they made her wait for like 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, 15 minutes better than seven hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, I'm going to throw Charlie completely under the bus here. Right. Because you know when you walked in today and you were like, oh, fuck, I forgot my shorts. <laughs> and you're like, oh, man, I've got to squat. I forgot my shorts. Yeah, but I, I, also, I, also, I also did follow up with, I'm just going to squat in shorts. Yeah, but then, I squat in pants. But then you're like, first world problems, I've got to squat in my tracksuit pants. Yeah, this first world problem was like a first world, like, it's a first world problem. What am I complaining about? <laughs> to be fair... I'd probably prefer to do that again than squat in pants. Like, <laughs> really not, like, but for me, it's a discomfort. Well, I'm going to squat in sweaty. pants today. Yeah, did, man, did he, wants, he wants me to go to Savers and Across buy shorts. Road. Yeah, just buy some secondhand shorts. But I'm going to squat in pants. Yeah. Now, now you've said I've got to do it. Yeah. That's I'm tough, squat man. In pants. Goggins, you'll be here. You'll be here. To yeah, Goggins, what, yeah. what would Goggins do? Go, you Start selling tickets to meet you. Like, <laughs> you'll be here so you can watch me squat in pants. So I'm just going to do incline bench and stuff. It's going to be good. I'm going to be impressed. Yeah. Um, squatting these are warm too. I've got um I've got uh an, another thing that I would like I would love to to learn a little bit more from. Um so obviously you, you said you came into powerlifting pretty strong. Oh yeah. Yeah, like you so what were your first how old were you? What were your first four few years of training with barbells and all of that? And then also I would love to know because I know you were at Melbourne Uni. Yes. Uh working under like the, the Wilkes system or, 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 or lifting under the Wilkes system, which anyone in the industry sort of knows is pretty much just like full throttle, like make it or break it type of thing. I'd love, I'd love to know that experience of coming up into powerlifting through that as well. Um, so my first, so I got taken to the gym by a guy that was my manager at Crown. I trained when I was like 17 for like a year. I cut heaps of weight. I, I got down to like 80 kilos. I just ate microwave chicken breasts and couscous, <laughs> right? And microwave couscous, it was Terrible. Any, uh, so any seasonings? Like microwave any? No, no. I put cheese on there sometimes. <laughs> so you put raw chicken breast in the microwave? Yeah, and then cook f- it. Oh just nuke God. it for like 10 minutes. <laughs> what the fuck? It come out like cardboard. This is how I ate when I met my missus, by the way. <laughs> and then, like, when I met my missus, I would sit there. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, meal prepping. And I'd get, like, a kilo and a half of chicken legs, put it in a pot, put salt, pepper, like, some master food, all-purpose seasoning, yeah. and then put rice in there and boil it. Right, and then the rice would soak up all the liquid, and then I eat that like all day. Right, what it was cooked. Fuck? That's fuck. So when I I remember I did I did nutrition with Sam Hall, uh, ethos strength, ethos strength. Yeah, and he was like, okay, so what vegetables do you? Eat? I was like, what do you mean? Like this is what I eat. And he's like, so besides the chicken legs and boiled <laughs> rice together, what do you eat? And I was like, that's what I eat every every day, seven days a week. Unless I get KFC. <laughs> like, so like, he was just like, dude. Unless like, I get the fancy chicken. So then we did a cut and he helped me heaps, but he was like, you could eat as many vegetables as you want. And I was hungry. So I'd sit there, I'd boil a 
kilo of vegetables at once and then eat the whole thing. It was like, I feel sick. I'm a stomach sore. I feel sick. So I went having like five grams of fiber to like 60, right? And I was, he's like, dude, you've completely missed the middle ground here. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this way, this way. Um, right, how, so, wait, how old are you when you're eating? Oh, you said until you met your partner. When did you meet your partner? <laughs> so I was like 25. Holy shit. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I cut, dude, it was like the shortest route to what I wanted. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I trapped the macros. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so starting lifting, you know, I started with a 200 deadlift. It was very strong. You know, it was benching. But you 100. started at 17. No, no. So when I was 17, I I don't think I deadlifted. I didn't really squat. I, I know I could bench 100 for reps yep. at 17, 80 kilos, 81 kilos. Um, but I go do like an hour of cardio every morning, then go, do you remember one, one more rep? Um, the pre-workout with the DMA in it. Oh. It's like 17 <laughs> cracked out of my mind on that stuff. Everyone has a story. I don't So a lot of info, but I don't know if you know what stim dick is. Stim nick? Or stim dick, dick. yeah. Stim stim dick. Right, no. so you like take DMA. Your and dick some doesn't people, work. Yeah, your dick doesn't yeah. work. Like whiskey dick. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, but way worse. So I was 17, be walking around with like mad <laughs> stim dick and I just couldn't, I'd be like, yeah, but it makes me feel really good at the gym. So, you know, deal with it. <laughs> like, um, Let's like, yeah. So anyway, I stopped training because I started working. Then I started again at 20, just when I was tw uh, 20 and a half. And I, I did a 200 deadlift, bench like 100 and I was squatting 180. And then I went in, <laughs> I went in and missed 200 for two weeks until I got it on the third week. Yeah. And then um, I moved to England. It's called peaking. It's, yeah, well that's it, right? <laughs> just go in and max out every week. That's what I did for a little bit. And then I went to England and I signed up at a gym there that was just like a commercial gym, but independently owned. Uh, and I met this guy, Ross, and he was an IPF lifter. And he was like, uh, you need to follow some kind of program. So I went on Reddit research and I was like, Chico's it. That's me. Yeah. So I did Chico for like, until I went to Melbourne Uni for like a year and a half then. Yeah. Went to Melbourne Uni. Oh man, that was... Uh, so how, how strong did you get in that one, one and a half, 18 months on Chico? Um, I squatted 270 something. So you made some gains. Yeah, deadlifted yeah. over 300 <laughs> and benched 170. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I got strong, man. I was training hard as. Yeah. And then, I like, there wasn't enough shoulders and back in there for me. So I added an extra day because I worked at the gym. Yep. So I added a six day in. and I, But, like, my knees and elbows were just constantly rooted because, you, you know, just super high frequency. My form wasn't great. Like, yeah. it wasn't bad. I actually got worse when I went to Melbourne Uni. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I came to Australia and I got called. I think I sent an email to someone and then Robert Wilkes called me. And I wanted to go train at Obsidian. And he was like, nah, nah, that's rubbish. Come train, <laughs> come train at Melbourne Uni. And I don't support any of this. Right? But I, was, yeah. I was a junior lifter. I was like, who's this Wilkes guy? And I was like, uh, is, is, do you reckon he's the one that made the points? And I asked him. And he's like, yes. And I was like, well, he probably knows what he's doing. So I drive. I lived in Melton West. I drive to Melbourne Uni two or three days a week. My first session there, he was the first. He was like, how much time? Because I had a shaved head. And I have like, lots of black and white tattoos and a beard. He's like, how much time did you do in prison? Like the first words out of mouth was like, uh, he's like, I was like, I didn't. He's like, you don't look like how you write because I write pretty well, like yeah. in emails and stuff. And I was like, oh, all right. And he's like, so you didn't go to prison? I was like, no, dude. Like, <laughs> <What> the <laughs> so fuck? then he's like, all right, you're fat. Let's see what you can do. And I was oh. like, oh, all right. And um, a lot of body image issues and that. And I was like, so I went through my session. He had me like max out for my five rep max on everything. And he's like, you're useless, but there's something there. Come back on Thursday and. For God knows what reason, <laughs> you came back. I came back, yeah. and then it was kind of this. Uh, you know, looking back at it though, man, it wasn't a good. Uh, it's a lot better now, so I've heard. Yeah. Obviously, they've got rid of that. Yeah. Um. But man, it was a horrible, horrible environment. That's why I left. Yeah. So I taught, but I, I felt like I, I felt trapped, yeah. right? Because you got the head of a Fed that isn't above abusing that power, does it fairly frequently, and I couldn't get out of it. So. I'd, I'd show up, I'd do my training. And you know what? Yeah, I was I was close with him at the time, but it was this weird kind of like you want the approval, mm. right? And you're young, you're impressionable. Mm. You Anyway, so like it, it's not a fond memory at all. Like I made good mates like Tony Reinmuth and that, but it was a very toxic environment. People, like I remember one day I, I've always had really bad body image issues and I got up the courage to train in a singlet. And someone came up and like, oh man, you don't have any muscle development at all. Like I thought you'd at least have some kind of delts, but you look like shit. What? And I was like, and this is just a member. I was like, oh, and I went and changed, put a shirt Fuck. on, right? And that was just accepted. That was, so it was really toxic, very, you know, not only the strong survive, but like, we're just going to beat you down and offend you. And this is when I was training. <laughs> um, 
and Rob was the same. It all comes down from the top, right? Because it's allowed. Like that would not fly in my gym. No, no, I imagine right. it would not fly here or in most gyms. No. Um, so I tore my quad at 2016 Worlds and I was like, oh, I'm just going to rehab this and then I'll come back. And then I just stopped answering the messages and calls. And then yeah. I, I, I went to uh, Janish. Uh, he helped oh, me yeah. a lot with my training and he yeah. helped me out. He's like, we're going to actually, because he went through the same thing. He's like, we're actually going to train smart and make you a better lifter. Yeah. And I progressed really well with him. But um, yeah, so like, you know, it was interesting. You look back at it, you can have a laugh, but you're like, man, that wasn't a good environment. Yeah, not at all. Um, you know, again, just even this the idea that you could just openly comment on someone's body out of nowhere, like literally walked across the gym, hadn't talked to this person for the day and then came up and said something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually crazy when you think about it. Yeah, that's so. A lot of this is like, you know, so when all this stuff happened mm-hmm. with PA, though, I sat back and people were like, oh, you know, how could we know this had happened? And I was like, we let a lot of shit fly, and a lot of the justification was that's just what they're like. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And like in hindsight, I was like, man, now that I know what I know, years later, I'm like, I would not let that fly anymore. I would call it out. I, you know what I mean? Yeah, it'd stop it. Yeah, yeah. like <clears throat> even if it's at the top, like you got to stand up for your lifters and yourself right not you don't need that doesn't mean be aggressive just means you know again you can vote with your wallet you can boundaries bring it up, yeah make yeah have boundaries um yeah so it was it was interesting uh and it's interesting looking back at it yeah i had some fun there though i had some good mates there but like it, in in general like the overall it wasn't a oh absolutely sounds yeah. like a yeah a, a poor time without a doubt yeah especially when you're young and impressionable and you're yeah. trying to like make a name in sport you're trying to I don't know. You have this idea that you need to impress the right people. Yeah. Again, because you're young though as well. That's the other thing. Like when you get older, you're like, man, so say if we had a disagreement, like that's all it needs to be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. When you're younger, you're like, oh, like this is my whole world and everyone, I know all my friends are in powerlifting and if I say anything or I leave, like it's going to come crashing down and that's kind of how it was for a fair while. Um, You know, and I think look, that still happens, I, I guess, on a small scale at gyms now. Like, I, I imagine, like, I don't know anyone personally. I think the only reason I think about it like that now is because I am on the upper level of the sport. I own a gym. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. power dynamic shifts. Yeah, absolutely. And you can you can create the environment that you want within your own. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it is. It, it, and also, yeah. if someone came up and just talked to me like shit now, I, I'd just be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Do you know what or I mean? You just like, walk away. But like, when you're 22. Yeah. That's and the, thing, you're the sad thing is now you're in a position where you'd be like, that just doesn't fly, but there's yeah. probably, you know, whether it's in power or I, other areas, there's people who, who are just like you back then who just let it slip and feel like they have so, to, this is just the normal thing. Like, yeah. Right. Like it's just accepted. Uh, I had this yeah. chick at, at Coles that works at Coles make a really racist joke to me like last year. And then she started laughing and I was like, yeah, that's not funny. We're not going to do that. And now she just won't look at me when I go there, but you know, that's the shift. I'm just quickly interrupting this podcast because Anthony, unfortunately is too jacked and too juicy and he moved his arm and he swung his elbow into his microphone input. And it meant that we got about 15 minutes of very crackly audio. So we actually had to cut out about 12 minutes. Um, You will hear some crackling across the next 90 seconds. If you can't put up with it, you can just skip across 90 seconds and you'll be able to continue with the final little piece of this podcast. Um, We're sorry about this. We'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Also, if you've made it this far, please either like, share, or subscribe this podcast. If you're following along on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Uh, And if you're on Spotify or Apple, five stars helps us a lot. Thank you very much. Again, it's only about 90 seconds. So if you can't put up with it, you can just skip ahead a couple of minutes and you'll be rolling again with good audio. You're too jacked, Anthony. You're too jacked. There, right? He's like, you know, back in there, like, oh, like walking yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah that's yeah. not funny. Yeah, you yeah. set your boundary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not going to tell her like that. In every aspect of life. But yeah, it's, it's interesting when you're young. You don't yeah. Maturity and I guess that, again, things seem a lot bigger than they are. Yeah. yeah. I, I still don't reckon I have the maturity to call someone out. Oh, no, actually, I did call you someone. You did, you no, call did someone I did, out. I did at that place. No, but <laughs> that place. In, that, in that situation, I still think I... I, no, I still uh, think... <laughs> well, there is. I We're still at, think I'd awkwardly laugh just because I can't be... I'm, I don't like confrontation. Oh, but that's the thing, though. Like, <clears throat> like, I always, like... Confrontation and aggression are, like, two different things. Like, so I'm, I'm not an aggressive person. Yeah. Like... I guess if you if you're on a night out and people are drinking, that's when a lot of aggression comes into it. But when you're in like a situation like Coles, if 
Because you're just like, that's not happening. Yeah. yeah. And just kind of, like, what can they say? Yeah. Like, oh, you're a piece of shit. I'm laughing at my racist joke. Like, do you know what I mean, though? Like, no, that's yeah, for yeah. me, at least. And that was something I realised as I got older. Like, you can tell someone and set boundaries without it being an aggressive thing. Now, yeah. They're not going to like it. Nobody likes if you realise you've messed up and crossed a boundary. But, and then for me, at least, like, you know, so even like with clients, if I have to set a boundary and then I just let it go, I'm like, hey, you know, you know, I, or they, vice versa. We know now, and then we just move on. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Coke, Coke zero, man. There's nothing better for me personally than like having fast food with a soft drink. Oh yeah, a, a beer doesn't. <laughs> alcohol doesn't. I don't know. If, doesn't the, cut it. You doesn't, need doesn't, the acid. You need you, the. Yeah, it doesn't know. Like I like. Yeah. I do enjoy having a, a couple of beers or whatever, and I could sit down and have a, like every so often have a few drinks or whatnot. But when I'm eating, it's got to be a soft drink. Yeah. And it just cuts through the yeah, oh, like an ice cold. It's the best. Zero. Oh, it's the Ooh. best. Yeah, it's actually an overrated uh, small bit of KFC pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can't eat KFC anymore. Oh, oh no. no, no, I blame KFC for so. <laughs> I got sent these two. I got sent order twice, like last year. On and, Uber Eats, yeah, uh, yeah, DoorDash, yeah, yeah whatever. And yeah. um, it was twenty something pieces of original recipe, and you oh. went through it. Well, I was like, I got to eat all. Of- this is again impulse control, isn't it? A real big <laughs> thing in my life, so I've got to take a lot of the the temptations away. So we can't have cookies in the house because I legitimately get up butt naked at like three in the morning and eat them because I sleepwalk and I sleep talk. And my missus will come downstairs. There'll be cookie crumbs everywhere. They'll be in the bed. <laughs> and I'll eat a whole thing of cookies without realizing. Because I remember there was this one point where I was like, Mickey, I'm not losing weight. I'm following everything. And Danny found me follow smashing the, these cookies. Yeah, you got to follow the cookie crumbs, mate. Got, what? 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 Vegemite. Cause then I sm- and, and bread. Because I was making like, you know, six Vegemite sandwiches without... Re- and Danny come, there's butter everywhere. Because I'm out of it. Uh, <laughs> I just... I'm picturing this massive jack dude, just like with like <laughs> food, just like asleep. It's bad, man. Um, but yeah, KFC, so they sent me 20 something pieces of original recipe and I was like, well, now Challenge I, need accepted. To, I need to eat them all. Yeah. And Danny was like, you could put it in the fridge. I was like, nah. come on, what are you, who are you talking? I'm gonna, this isn't going in the fridge, it's going in here. I thought I was going to die. Oh, really? I, I mean, my heart rate was like 130 because of all the salt and shit. <laughs> so I was sitting there and I was sweating. I was drenched. I had to take my shirt off afterwards. I was like, oh, I can't. No, never again. So, I, like, so I'm sitting there. It like, wrecked KFC for you. Wrecked KFC for me. I'm scared of it now. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, because, again, it was yeah, purely my fault. Yeah. I'm not. Too delicious. <laughs> um, I'm not scared. You got to try yeah. Charlie. 20 pieces. Charlie Whoa. Goggins. Into Dude, Goggins' mindset. All this talk of KFC is making me want eat KFC. Those, eat those wicked wings, Charlie. 20 something original recipe and like two large tips and then whatever. Like with yeah, That's a lot of salt. That's a shit ton of salt. I'm like, what's the fatal amount of sodium? <laughs> <laughs> You're on the limit. Yeah. yeah. Um, Stan Effity. Underrated crap. pleasure in life is actually reheated KFC the next day. Oh, really? So good in the, in the it's microwave. It's pretty messed up, man. Yeah. I love it. You should try, <laughs> try it in that, a... I think that's a... Uh, try, try it in a pot with uh, rice. <laughs> rice and water. And yeah, just let yeah. it go. Yeah, exactly. You, can't, you got no rice. So I'm going to mess <laughs> yes. up. You're throwing you mean, No, I've evolved. <laughs> you evolved. You you man, you man, you I, know, I remember because my, my... Danny was like, do you want me to do your meal prep for you? I was like, sure, but it's really easy. She's like, no, no, I'll make you proper food. And like then she ruined food, it for yeah. me. Like, I couldn't... Not ruin it, but now I expect my food to taste good. Like... That that's yeah the the taste because that sounds miserable. Bro, <laughs> that it is just, miserable. It was fucked, yeah. <laughs> but it was easy. It was cheap. You know, it all go down together because the. Yeah. Ugh, that's too good. Um, we'll wrap it up there because we're gonna go train, and obviously you came from the other side that of it. What one. are you? What are you actually hitting today? What's your session like? So I've got incline bench, uh, pack deck or cable flies, yep. and then some tries. Some arms and delts and something. Yeah. Else. I don't what know. are you hitting on the incline? On dips. I don't yep. know. So this is the first time doing it in ages. It's eight at about an RP eight. Yep. So anywhere from like, I haven't done it for ages. So anywhere from like one thirty to one sixty, I guess. Yep. Cool. Like nice. We're actually going to get a little bit of. Con- I think. Di- I don't know if you're. I think you're training as well. If, if you can get the shorts. Do you like dips? Do you like dips? Dips. Chest dips. Like oh, dips. I love dips, man. Yeah, because I haven't done them for years, and I've got a few clients that have been asking from lately. Some I want to might bring back. So, I two them. things I yeah. I think help my bench a lot. One, incline bench helps. I'd always notice a massive correlation between my incline going up and my bench yep. getting way better, getting stronger, and and dips. But I also find dips really easy on my joints. Yep, that's so, the other thing. Oh, really? So, nice. Yeah. So I'm pretty, and, and yeah. obviously they just work well with my mechanics. I got pretty you, short. I'm assuming you load them up. How do you load them? Yeah, no, yeah. I just weight belt. Yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah. but like I got pretty short, like humerus and that. So I think it's pretty easy yeah. with the angles 
on my yeah. joints, but I love dips. Love dips. Frost dips. A, a last question, I think, to wrap it up. Jay Impressed, yes or no? <laughs> yeah, you you said you liked right. it. Someone actually you guys came... don't like it. No, apparently I've been no doing it. it. <laughs> <laughs> apparently I've been doing it the whole so, time, and I didn't even know. Jay Impressed. So... <laughs> I don't mind it now. It's pretty hard on the sh- on the elbows, but again, I don't I, I don't really get an issue with it. It's not something I program <laughs> like yeah. often, but I, I've done it and I love it. Um, I'll show you how how I do it today, right? Can we, yeah, the find the big out. thing We're is, find man, out. is like is honestly starting here, nice and high up, and then just collapsing the elbows. Yep. Down to your chin or your neck. Well, I feel like that's how you were definitely doing the JM press. Last week, yeah, Charlie did it. I've got to add some yeah. context to the JM press. Um, yeah, because it's you got to press straight up with yeah. it though. You can't treat it anything like a skull crusher. It's the elbows die. All right, we're gonna get a video on how to do a JM press from, tutorial from yeah. Anthony. Uh, but a couple of context. Two people came up to me at breakthrough and were like, "Oh, the, don't see any JM presses here." Like, it, it, it definitely that video it's definitely it. spread into the community. You've been shared a bit. Now, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's your best bang for your buck. But like I get Jay impressed in my program, I'm like oh yeah, sweet. yeah cool. You get tens, yeah. I'll, I'll load it like a hundred kilos or something, yeah. and nice. and do it. But like, yeah, it, do I like? Am I going to say hey, do that over some other tricep dominant movement? Like absolutely. But no, but I don't have an issue with it. I enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. And well, then, the reason I'm so because Bryce gave it to me a while ago, and I just felt like this is where the comments that I never got anything out of it. My elbows hurt, why not? But I feel like I've built up my tricep volume a fair bit more lately. So my elbows feel better, but I was doing barbell skull crushes. He thought at he was home. doing barbell skull crushes. I was doing it at home because I've only got a barbell at home. And then last week we were filming a video, and they're all looking at me they're like, "You're doing the JM press." <laughs> and I'm like, "No, nah, it's still, like I'm going to the mouth more so than my skull." He's doing but mouth JM press. JM press. He goes a bit more to the neck sort of area, but I feel like mouth, <laughs> mouth. And what you just said, I squashed the elbow. Like, yeah, you're doing you, the JM press. You know, it's just like you know, it's bad for you. It's, it's just like when people say deadlifts are bad for your back because they mess themselves up once on it. Yes, in like high school. I think that might be. I reckon right. this. I, is think that might be I, I don't. Get, we, I never said that they were bad for your elbows. I want to retract that. They don't, they, I know a lot of they people just hurt your elbows. They hurt my yeah. elbows, which at is the, fine at the like, time. Yeah, it's it, at the time it hurt my elbows, and so I avoided them because then it was carrying over to my bench. Yeah. But I feel like now I've gone to a point where I can actually it's like. For me, the movement I fell in love with that I used to love was military press, like oh, barbell really? military press. I used to love it. I was really good at it, and then for powerlifting, I was like. It's, it's, useless and will was like dude let's just do some other shoulder stuff let's use dumbbells because i tore my delt doing it yep. oh really yeah that's that's what how, first time i went to dan like yeah good essay because i like tore my delt like grade two tear military pressing 140 for reps wow. in the garage funnily enough in never lockdown. heard anyone tear a delt before yeah well i have horrible mobility for it right yeah. so i'd come down and be like this huge yeah. stretch and then <laughs> the, uh, like and bounce. Range. yeah so like but my shoulders and everything in my elbows feel way better since He's I stopped military it. press. I was going to say, is there one thing that you just hate? I know maybe it's military press. Can no, we get no, a sound bite of that? Can you it. say, oh, I hate the military press. It sucks. And no, we can make a snippet oh, of really it. Really black what, and white. I'm going to, yeah, there's no yeah. gray area. Yeah. <laughs> What's one thing you hate? And it has to be like a loaded movement. Surely there's something that you just never program. Okay. Something <laughs> I personally hate for powerlifting, front squats. I hate front squats. All right, cool. We're going to make- stick by it. There are so many better things you can do than <laughs> front squats. Give us, you. give us your, your better, one better thing that you would do. Sorry? Give us that. that what, what's a better thing that you would do, do you over front squats? What do you replace it with? Any other kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. Because ours is a safety, safety squat, yeah, well, but we just we go SSB. I mean, yeah, like, I love SSB, but I don't know, man. Like, I love programming machines and that for yeah. quad dominant, Fucking like, nice. movements, like hack yeah. squats and shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, all right, just swap it with SSB. I don't care. Swap it with anything else. Just, no, no, like I just anything, get, so, so you anything. would prefer for a quad dominant, get on a hack squat or, and just pound the yeah, shit out. Yeah, or again, it. like, you know, if you're closer to comp than that, though, like SSB, like yeah. I love, I have a really good SSB. How too. dare you? No, but, that's man, all, that's all, all, I'm sorry. You hate that's all we cop. Can, when can, we cop the JM press, it was like, look how in the dare camera you? And yeah, can you look at the camera? And this is going to be the sign up and just say, if you do front squats, you're doing it wrong or something like that. If you do front squats, you're an idiot.